last two talks of the day. So next up is Michele Palmira from the University of Modena at Radio who will be talking to us about arbitrary descriptive names and the natural problem. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'd like to sorry. I'd like to thank Andrea and uh, Francesca, especially thanks for accepting the paper. And actually, I also uh, want to confess my original sin, which is that I'm not really working in the, in the philosophy of mathematics. I mostly work in the philosophy of language, but I mean, I think, or at least hope, that some problems in the philosophy of mathematics can be fruitfully addressed by looking at some philosophy of language ideas. And this is what I'd like to do basically today. So, yeah. Is this one? Yes. No, no, not fine. Well, actually, I'd like to focus on these three um, theses arithmetical realism, which is the view that natural numbers exist. Then what I'll call the singularity claim, which is the view that a number naming expression such as a numeral, like numeral three, behaves or at least seems to behave like a proper name, which refers to a single determining abstract object, the natural number three. And what I'm gonna call the arbitrariness claim, which is the view that very roughly it's arbitrary which objects natural numbers are. And as you might expect, the arbitrariness claim relies on what is commonly known as the Vinassar problem. Now, since I'm not really a philosopher of mathematics, I don't want to present you the Vinassar problem, but just to fix the terminology I'm going to use and to say to see whether uh, I mean the reconstruction of the argument is I'm going to use is, is a good one. So basically, I'm going to say that any account of what na natural numbers are should satisfy this formal adequacy constraint, which is usually defined by these two subclauses, providing model of the piano axioms and explaining cardinality in terms of counting. Then there's Bernasco's well-known Ernie and Johnny case, the two different vertical progressions. I don't want to really spend time on this because I guess that all of you know the, uh, what the problem here is. But this is just my reconstruction of the argument in the Nasser paper. I guess it's a fair reconstruction, or at least it's sort of it's a Benasraf like problem, which you have the assumption arithmetical realism is true, then you have the reductionist premise that numbers are identical, for instance, to sets, which is gonna be which is gonna be the fourth premise, and then the third premise is that any reduction or identification is a good identification, it's an adequate uh, uh, identification if and only if the formal adequacy constraint devised by Ben Asraf is met. Then there are the different set theoretical progressions, different identifications of the number three with different sets, as we all know. And basically, I'd like to focus, the, the arbitrariness claim is sort of included in the in step. Eleven, which according to Penasraf, since both set theoretical reductions preserve formal adequacy, there is no non-arbitrary reason in favor of the thesis that there is a unique set which is the number three. So and this is again a, a rough formulation of the arbitrariness claim, and I'm going to say something more on what arbitrariness really is. I mean, how I'd like to intend. And then Penasraf first of all concludes that. Uh, there, are, there is no good reduction of numbers to set, and from that he concludes that arithmetical realism is true. So this is a uh, brief reconstruction of the argument when Asperger proposes. And as you all know, there have been various reactions to uh, this argument. Uh, these are just six reactions. Some of them actually uh, reject some premises. For instance, the uh, reductionist premise or the, the idea that all there is to natural numbers are the, uh, basically the structural properties uh, which are um, included in formal adequacy constraint, then uh, you can say, for instance, you can be more sympathetic to the conclusion of the Nasraf's argument by saying that you accept the conclusion and you explain the singularity claim away by saying, for instance, as Pettigrew does, that not numerals, even though it seem, they seem to behave like proper names, they actually are free variables. So there are many, actually, much more reactions than 
those have just listened here, but I don't want to focus on work that has already been done, but I'd like basically try to uh, account, that, that, that's the point, to account for the compatibility between the singularity claim, which says basically that numerous behave like proper names, uh, the arbitrariness claim, which is going to be clarified in a while, and arithmetical realism by proposing a new uh, approach to this uh, topic. And as I said uh, before, I'm more, much more a philosopher of language, and I'd like to rely on some philosophy of language ideas here. And I'll try to propose the view that number naming, singular number, number naming expressions such as numerals behave like arbitrary descriptive names. And of course, I'll, I'd like to explain what arbitrary descriptive names are. Now, first of all, uh, why is, uh, I should say that uh, uh, numerals are these arbitrary descriptive names? Well, very briefly, because there are some problems with a, a dominant, with a standard account uh, of uh, basically how the reference of proper names uh, is fixed. Now, the standard story, as uh, all of you know, is that, for instance, uh, the reference of proper name like Andrea Sereni, for instance, is fixed by a reference fixer uh, who is causally connected to the, ob to the object, and he performs sort of baptism by saying, your name will be Andrea, okay. And the two main semantic features of uh, proper names according to the standard story is that they are devices of direct reference. So the semantic content of a name is the object, okay. And they are rigid designators, so they refer to the same object in all possible words. Now this is a very rough formulation of the, rigid, of the rigidity thesis. I don't think that we need to be more specific than that. So just stick to the very broad idea. And now, of course, if the singularity claim is correct, the best explanation we have, uh, I mean, the dominant explanation of the, the proper names we have in the philosophy of language should be applied to the case of numerals, but here it seems that we run into troubles because it seems very likely that we cannot be acquainted uh, with numbers. So we cannot bear the uh, causal connection needed in order to perform the act of baptism required in order to fix the reference of uh, the numerals. And this can be argued in many ways. For instance, uh, uh, well, the crucial problem is that uh, numbers are uh, abstract objects and traditionally ab abstract objects are not special temporally located and they are unchanging and it seems to conflict with two necessary conditions of causation, and so it seems that actually we cannot deploy uh, the standard story of uh, reference in the case of proper names in the case of uh, numerals. And this might leave us in an impasse, so one might think that since the dominant explanation we have about the reference of proper names is fixed, doesn't work in this case, perhaps this does jeopardize the singularity claim itself. So perhaps this is just good reason to give up the idea that numerals behave like proper names. Or maybe one might try to somehow revise, somehow try to stick to the causal historical picture of reference and maybe uh, try to spell out acquaint the acquaintance uh, condition of reference in a non-causal way. So these are, these are two uh, uh, ways two routes, actually two paths, one might want to cover, but again, uh, I'd like to sort of propose an alternative approach, which is that of saying that numerals behave like arbitrary descriptive names. So now, very briefly, what descriptive, descriptive names are, and then I'll get back to the arbitrariness point, which is very uh, important here. Now, the idea is that descriptive names uh, uh, differently from uh, unlike ostensive names are those names whose reference is not fixed by an acquaintance relation to the object, but is fixed by a uniquely reference fixing description, which is used in a attributive way, which picks out the object the name refers to. So here are a couple of examples from the literature, well-known examples. The first one is due to 
So quick key, uh, it's the case of Neptune. And prior to any telescopic confirmation in 1845, Urbain de Verrier coined the name Neptune to refer to the then observed, unobserved planet, uniquely responsible for the perturbations in the orbit of Uranus. So the idea is that de Verrier was not acquainted with the object, but he introduced the name in order to speak of the planet in an object-like fashion, as it were. And the same holds for uh, Evans, Gertrude, Evans well-known Julius example. Evans coined the name Julius, uh, introduced it in, uh, into the language via the definite description whoever invented the zip, or zip inventor, the zipper, whatever we, you want here. Uh, in general, we can state the reference conditions of descriptive names in this way, so for any object O, uh, the uh, descriptive name refers to O if and only if the unique object which satisfies the description is identical to O. And basically, what I'd like to very simply suggest here is that the reference of numerals is fixed in a very similar way. And the idea is this. So let the satisfier of the formal adequacy constraint be an omega sequence, so it, which is basically Ben Asraf, uh argument. So we have a sequence uh, of objects. The idea is that uh, the numeral zero refers to whichever object uniquely satisfies the description, the least element of the satisfier of the formal adequacy constraint. So you have the sequence and the number, uh, the numeral zero, refers to the least element of the satisfier of the formal adequacy constraint. This is the way in which the reference of zero, uh, of the numeral zero is fixed. The same holds for one, with, uh, for the numeral one, which refers to whichever object uniquely satisfies the description, the next to the least element of the satisfier of the formal adequacy constraint, and so on and so forth. So, Instead of saying that there is an act of baptism, basically what I'm suggesting is that uh, uh, numerals are introduced via definite descriptions into the language. So let me just briefly say something on uh, the semantic features of uh, descriptive names. So I don't want to focus on uh, rigidity because it's uh, standard that assume that rigidity is preserved in this case. But I'd like to focus on the semantic content of descriptive names because it's much more interesting. Uh, because there is no, first of all, there is no general agreement in the standard cases of descriptive names uh, about what the semantic content of such names is. And there, there are the two uh, very well-known views. On one hand, the million view, which says that the referent is the content of the name. And there is the descriptivist view which says that it's the reference fixing description itself which is part of the content of the name. And it seems to me that we should, if, since the aim of this paper is to account for the compatibility between uh, realism and singularity claim, I should try to uh, argue for a million account of descriptive names, basically because it's just the million account which preserves the singularity claim for the very reason that if we had a description in the content of a name, we would lose singularity, but we, we, we would have definite description which analyzed that uh, Russell uh, is a quantified statement. So we would lose the singularity inside which uh, I'd like to uh, preserve, basically. So I take it that there are two very broad considerations in favor of the million account uh, of um, descriptive names. Uh, first of all, there's this well-known semantic argument against descriptivism, according to which speakers can competently use the name even though they lack any description that uniquely applies to its referent. And that seems also the case with numerals because laymen use numerals even though they do not understand or fully master the reference fixing descriptions I introduced above, above. So this seems to be in line uh, with the idea I'm trying to suggest here. And then a second reason which actually relies, draws on, the, on Kripke's semantic argument is to focus on what the role of numerous language could be. And it seems to me that uh, the million as 
a fairly good, a, very, a fairly intuitive explanation of what the world of numerals into language is, whereas the descriptivist does not have such an account. And the account that Emilia has, to my mind, is that, very simply, numerals allow us to, allows us to speak about numbers in an object-like fashion. So, when we use numerals into the language, we just want to talk about numerals as particulars besides the properties that they are taken to uh, have. So that seems to be a, a feature that median, uh, a median account can preserve. By contrast, it's not clear to me what the descriptivist could say uh, on this problem. Actually, there is an answer in the philosophy of language letter, literature on which I'm not going to focus on here, uh, but maybe we can talk later on during the discussion. But it's an unsatisfactory answer. This is why, basically, I'm not citing it. So I guess that there are good reasons in favor of million account, which is, is important because it should allow us to preserve somehow the singularity inside. So this is, I'll try to sketch out uh, um, a proposal about why numerals are descriptive names. But I said that the view is that numerals are arbitrary descriptive names. So, what does that mean? Well, actually this relies to the point that Francesca raised uh, this morning concerning uh, arbitrariness. And the idea, as Francesca mentioned this morning, there are basically three views on what arbitrariness could be. Uh, and I'm gonna side uh, with uh, well, a minority, I don't know, a growing minority, I would say, uh, Bracken, Rich, and Magidor, Francesca herself, Enrico Martino, and also uh, in the paper by Carrara and Martino in 2010 paper, they defend, or at least discuss, this epistemic interpretation, which is roughly put the idea that even though there are infinitely many sequences which may satisfy the formal deposit constraint, we we'll lack the epistemic access to the realm of abstract that needed to know which one uniquely satisfies it. Now, uh, uh, to be sure, Francesca doesn't talk about uh, natural numbers, so I don't want to attribute to her uh, a view that which she doesn't actually have. But the idea is that uh, arbitrariness is epistemic in kind, so we do not know uh, which objects, uh, which object, the na uh, natural number three really is. That's the idea of arbitrariness. And this idea, in my view, fits nicely within the idea that numbers, uh, that numerals, the reference of numerals is fixed by definite descriptions because in that case we do not have discriminating knowledge of which number the uh, which object the natural number three is. So it seems to me that there is a good parallel parallelism between the epistemic inter interpretation and the idea that the reference of uh, numerals is fixed by uh, David descriptions. So of course this might have some epistemological problems which I'm happy to talk about even later on. So basically the idea uh, as far as the Benassar problem is concerned, is that I grant, basically, I concede to Benassar that it's arbitrary which adequate reduction numbers receive. So I grant that a step in Benassar's argument, but I reject the idea that from this arbitrariness claim, which is an epistemic claim, we should conclude that there is no cor correct reduction or identity claim at all. Because, in my view, our epistemic access to the correct reduction is not a necessary condition for its existence. And very briefly, I think that there are good reasons, at least as far as reference to abstract objects are concerned, to separate semantic uh, issues from epistemic issues. So, very briefly, just to show you where I say it, that the argument uh, should be blocked. The argument should be blocked at step 10, basically. I reject the idea that uh, uh, if there is 
just one reduction, we should be able to answer the questions which one <coughs> and why. If the reference of a new mass is fixed in the way I'm trying to suggest, basically, uh, we should reject this idea. And well, why should we reject this idea? Well, again, this is a sort of philosophical language point which should motivate why uh, um, we can or we better separate semantic from epistemic issues. First of all, uh, it seems that imposing an acquaintance constraint on reference immediately rules out reference to those objects with which we cannot be acquainted. So it seems that we got a very a tsuna, tsuna a picture of our reference works and this would exclude a lot of uh, cases in which we seem to generally refer uh, in an object-like fashion to objects such as abstract objects but also, I mean, you might think about fictional entities, future entities and all sorts of cases which go in uh, that direction. And second point is that it seems to me that there is a sort of generalization which smells a little bit hasty to my mind and the idea is that a model of reference which works in the domain of concrete objects can be harmlessly extended to the domain of abstract objects which quite independently of semantic considerations is taken to be very different from that of concrete objects so I'm, I'm not saying that I have arguments against or for this um, generalization of course there could be argument for but the idea is that instead of pursuing that uh, uh, path, basically, I'm just trying to suggest that there is an alternative option, which is the idea of saying that the reference uh, can be fixed in this alternative way. And so that the idea is that we, we can avoid to generalize a model of reference uh, to, uh, which was for the you know, domain of concrete objects to this other domain of objects, because basically we have an alternative account, which is the one I'm, I've been trying to uh, sketch out here. So, um, very brief, briefly, there are, there are many objections which can be raised to this idea. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, one, of, one objection uh, which has been raised by Francesca in a communication, which I hope I got it right, uh, is that uh, has to do basically with uh, instantial reason. So, and if I got uh, the point uh, Francesco was raising, is that there are supposed that uh, uh, rules of inference, such as universal generalization and existential instantiation, presuppose the possibility of referring, at least ideally, to any object of the domain of discourse. Then, suppose also that the meaning of quantifiers is fixed by their introduction and elimination rules, then quantification presupposes arbitrary methods. Now, since the logical formalization of definite descriptions analyzed at Russell requires existential quantification, it might seem that basically I'm presupposing what I have to explain. So I'm presupposing uh, arbitrary reference in order to sort of explain it uh, arbitrary reference because I'm explaining our, uh, reference uh, to numbers by relying on definite description which in turn require uh, existential uh, quantification which in turn requires uh, um, introduction in the nation rules which in turn require uh, arbitrary reference. That's, that was I hope a bit the uh, idea that Francesca was suggesting. And uh, what I'd like to say here is basically that there are different kinds of arbitrary reference and that uh, names occurring in instantial reasoning are not arbitrary descriptive names. So I'd like to uh, sort of uh, um, respond to the circularity worry by saying that names occurring in instantial reasoning do not work like numerals, basically. Even though in both cases, arbitrary reference is involved. 
And my, the idea, I mean, uh, the intuition I have here is that uh, the object uh, uh, A refers to an instantial reason. And so when, when we go from an existential assumption to uh, an instance, so when, uh, when we go to uh, there is an X, uh, bad X to P, uh, PA, uh, the object A refers to an instantial reason. It need not play a specific role besides that of being an arbitrary object of the universe. So we don't need uh, any uh, definite description to fix its reference. And to be honest, I have no account of how the reference of arbitrary names in instantial reasoning is fixed. Uh, there, there is a proposal which Francesca was mentioning uh, um, this morning, which, which is a proposal developed by Enrico Martino, which is called the Acts of Choice Semantics, which involves quite a bit of idealization. Act, actually, I don't know if this is the good semantics of uh, the reference of arbitrary names. Uh, directly, Richard Magidor, who discuss arbitrary reference, do not really put forward uh, uh, an explanation of how reference is fixed in such cases. So. I just, I really don't know what the semantics of uh, arbitrary names in uh, instantial reason could be, but what I could say is that surely it should be different from that involving uh, descriptive names that uh, I try to uh, um, sketch out here. Because there's this difference that there is no definite description which fixes uh, uh, reference of an arbitrary name like A in essential reasoning. By contrast, in the case of numerals, it seems to me the object, uh, the numeral 3, refers to an arithmetical discourse, has to play a specific role, which is that of occupying a certain place in an omega sequence. So, in the case of numerals, we can have that it, it makes sense, I mean, it could make sense at least to speak of uh, arbitrary descriptive names, because we can single out a definite description which fixes the, the uh, reference. In the case of instantial reasoning, it seems to me that we don't have a similar possibility. So, basically, the idea is that uh, I'm relying, uh, I grant all that could be uh, granted to the, to the objection, uh, but I take it that there are two different kinds of arbitrary uh, referencing. Uh, in place here, and this should uh, address a little bit the circularity worry, because here we need, uh, uh, in order to explain uh, um, the logical formalization of definite with description, we don't need to account to, to bring into the picture arbitrary descriptive names, but maybe, probably, it's not even sure that we should, we just need arbitrary names which have a different semantics, even though I don't know which one is the which one is the right semantics of arbitrary names, I guess that it's not the... Um, it does involve definite description, basically. And the other objection that I received, actually, from a referee for this conference <coughs> is that the strategy proposed above would at most give an account of numerals, but not of natural numbers. There is more to natural numbers than those properties which constitute the formal adequacy constraint. And to this objection, actually, I think that I could reply the way a structuralist could reply. So by saying that all that matters, all there is to natural numbers, are they are they all the theoretical properties? So uh, according to uh, certain uh, a realist version of structuralism. Natural numbers need not be richer uh, uh, abstract objects. All we need is already captured in the formal adequacy constraint. Uh, so, for this reason, I say it that um, this objection, uh, I mean, of course we can reject uh, structuralism, so that's, that, that's an option, but I say it that the account I've been trying to uh, uh, present today is compatible with a form of structuralism. Of course, it's going to be a sort of epistemicist structuralism because uh, it doesn't give us access, let's say, to the objects, but in a way, this is what I want to 
since the beginning because I want to try to show that it's possible to argue for the compatibility between the singularity claim, basically that numerous behave like uh, proper names, the arbitrariness claim, which is intended in an epistemic fashion here, and arithmetical real. So it seems that this is kind of compatible with uh, structure, structure, structuralist approach to arithmetic, and uh, I guess that's it. So suppose your account is right, and I'm wondering how you can explain the um, possibility, possibility of communication between different people about the natural numbers. So one person talks about three, the other person talks about three, it looks like they're talking about the same thing. But if your account is correct, it might be that one. The first person talks about three, three picks out, refers to the zero melo three, when the second person is talking about three, um, three, the word three mm -hmm. picks out the the um, von Neumann three. Um, and it could happen uh, just by coincidence that they could have the same three, but it might not. No, yeah, actually, uh, the, the, the idea is that uh, the number three has, uh, is a particular set, let's say, it's, it, it, if you want to uh, go with the classical Benastra's uh, picture. So it's either the Zermelo set or the Phenomenon set, but the, the arbitrariness point is that we don't know which one uh, it is, basically. So uh, that's for the, the reference part. Now, how the uh, so the uh, the question uh, the answer to the question how do we know is that we don't. Uh, but basically, what I guess the structuralist could say is that we don't even need to know that because all we need to know is, the, uh, is that there is something which satisfies uh, uh, the formal adequacy constraint, and that's enough to, uh, um, to, talk about, uh, to talk about numbers. And from that, of course, uh, uh, the two uh, laymen, let's suppose, they do not uh, perhaps even grasp the, the, the relevant definite description, so this might be another problem concerning communication, but here, we can appeal maybe to some sort of division of linguistic labor. So we could say that uh, uh, layman use of numerals is uh, parasitic, is sort of deferred use to the expert, which are the, the structuralists which grasp the, uh, defi the relevant definite description. So they grasp the relevant definite descriptions and then you have sort of Patnamian idea of how uh, people uh, uh, manage to refer to uh, the same object. So that, that would be... Yeah, I mean, my question wasn't uh, how we know that they're referring to the same thing. I was taking it that they are referring to the same thing. Okay. And then it seems like on your account it would be an amazing coincidence if it always turned out that they managed to refer to either that they both refer to the Zermelo 3 or they no, both I, refer I, to I mean, the I mean, it's yeah, three. Well, actually, it's... Uh, it's not, I don't know how to put it. Uh, let, let's say it's, let's say it's not a, a purely referential coincidence. So uh, it's an epistemic coincidence in the sense that we don't know, but once you, once you have the reference fixed in the description, that, that description picks out the unique object which satisfies uh, description and that's it that, 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 that should be uh, uh, enough I guess uh, to, uh, to ensure the, uh, that uh, it's I mean it could be a coincident a coincidence in the sense that it's not up it's not uh, it's not us who decide basically uh, which num uh, which object number three is but it's sort of determined in the uh, realm of, uh, let's say, abstract objects by uh, means of, of this referential mechanism which picks up uh, the same object. And yeah, I don't know if this addresses maybe. Yeah, it doesn't quite address my word. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I understand that the, that the reference fixing is arbitrary and that, uh, that the speaker need not know mm -hmm. um, which, 
one or when the zero neighbor numbers refers to. But my question is more, suppose I accept your picture for one person, but now consider two people, or now consider 10 people all talking about the number three. Mm -hmm. um, it would seem like in each utterance, it could, the number three could be picking up. And sometimes it's picking up the von Neumann three, sometimes it's picking up the Zermelo three. But it seems like on the face of it that they're all talking about the same thing, the, the number three. But on your account, it seems like it could be that each time someone says three, they're talking about something different. Uh. Uh. I had a question, but I had also a, 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 a short follow-up. The point is not that sometimes they refer to one and sometimes they refer to other. According to his uh, uh, account, they refer only to the same. The yeah. point is that we don't know which one, but it's all only the same. No, yeah, that 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 was that was our, that, that's what I was trying to. But maybe it's, we can elaborate on that later on. Because I don't I don't know what else I could say here, other than what what Marco is, is suggesting. So do you mean that on your view, it's always that in the history of the, the universe that every once in a while oh, it refers to one of the discussion. No, yeah, that, that, no, that, that, no that, 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 that's a different question, which I mean has to do with has even I mean even some historical concerns about this this idea. So, uh, well, uh, I mean we can imagine that when people introduce numerals into language, they were not introduced via these uh, definite descriptions. So, uh, uh, if you're saying that maybe uh, in the past they uh, uh, since the Definite description uh, maybe uh, changed in the in the history, and they picked out uh, different names. If that that sort of word, if you have actually, I don't know how to answer to that. Uh, what I could say is that actually, uh, when you go this uh, this way uh, with des descriptive names, you're not obliged to say that the reference fixing. Act is a stipulative act which happens just in, in a while, so you can sort of tell a story of how, uh, um, even though we did not begin with these descriptions, there were some sort of similar descriptions before in the history of the universe, let's say, as, as, you, as you put it. Uh, for instance, people did not have the, the idea of formal legacy constraint, but maybe had the idea of uh, numbers are what we. Uh, uh, can I adapt what we can count with, and this could be seen as sort of of ancestor, let's say, of uh, this idea. And but well, I mean historically, I don't know, I don't really know what what, what to say. I'm, I'm sorry. So I think in your account there's a remarkable amount of coincidences. All mm -hmm. these. Uh, it's a coincidence that uh, they use the same reference from Amazon. And I'm not comfortable with that. And these are things that I have been empirically studied, how for small numerosities, how, how we can know that the children, for example, they have the same thing in mind when they learn the word for free. Mm -hmm. And we know that the same neurons activate. So a lot is known by empirical research. So this is not not a question, really, but a suggestion. No, yeah, no, thanks. That. No, no, you, no, you're right. Uh, I, should, I should look at that, that, that literature. Thanks, yeah. So, um, well, we have one minute. Uh, you're next, but <laughs> 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 I already made it. Okay, so then, Francesca's next? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, I don't want to take somebody else's merits. Uh, uh, we did have that uh, in an exchange, and we chat about a, a lot about that. Uh, but really, I just put forward the objections that I thought Eric Martino would put. So okay. it's maybe based on his intuitions there. Uh, but nevertheless, so my question would be: um, I'm not totally clear on uh, what are the reasons why um, arbitrary names would be would would have a different behavior than uh -huh. arbitrary descriptive descriptive names. And, and the worries is the following. So as far as I got it, your idea would be that the, the numeral three 
um, refers to in arithmetical discourse. Um, so yeah, while the numeral three refers to in the, the numerical uh, arithmetical discourse should play the specific role of occupying a certain place in an illegal That's right. And, and, and is that the stress on specific that should make the, the difference in between arbitrary descriptive names and arbitrary names full stop? No, it's the idea is that you don't uh, actually, uh, in the case of existential reasoning, uh, you there's an asymmetry in the sense that you don't have a similar, uh, it's not just specific. Well, it, it's the, the whole description that you don't have in the case of, of uh, arbitrary names in essential reason. So you don't have the fact that uh, the object, uh, the number refers to, uh, to should occupy, uh, well, not necessarily a specific position. It has to be a specific position because, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an order. But it's the idea that it should play uh, this role of occupying a, a position, then it, it should be a, a specific position because it's, uh, it's, it's so, another theoretical uh, property, let's say. So basically, uh, the idea would be that uh, in arbitrary descriptive names, uh, the fixing of um, the arbitrary object uh, would come by some sort of description that we yeah. apply to it. Well, this happens also in the case of arbitrary names, full stop. So I say, let n be the um, I don't know, uh, first prime, num prime number uh, larger than blah blah blah. So uh, it's, it, the, the, the example from instantial reasoning is exactly going that way. Oh, I mean, we make some assumptions on how we want a, a certain natural, uh, an arbitrary national number to, to behave, and we draw conclusions from that, from, from, from that. It's not that arbitrary names are given somehow in isolation. Oh, so, I uh, so yeah. I, th that's why I cannot really see the difference between the two accounts, and that is why well, I'm not totally sure that no, you, can, you can make your way out of the objections of, no, the, yeah. of the circularity objection. Okay, no, uh, uh, what? Maybe you, yeah, just very quick. Yeah, uh, maybe some, something one could say that in the case of numerals, uh, the reference the, uh, fixed description should be the same. Uh, I mean, for the numeral three, should be the same in all cases. By contrast, in the case of arbitrary uh, names. I mean, you could ch you could change the description by which uh, you introduce uh, um, the arbitrary name, and I don't think this is going to make a real difference. But maybe one could go that way and say that the uh, it, the reference fixed in the description, the numeral case, is something more stable than in uh, in the case of uh, arbitrary names, and this maybe could uh, allow us to uh, say something, uh, well, to uh, dispose of this circularity worry in, in uh, maybe in another direction, but. Okay, so in the interest of leaving this place before tomorrow morning, I think we should thank you.